Hi, my name is Mike Butterworth. I am the uh, director for the Center uh, for Sports Communication and Media here at the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. And it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you here to our event, the University of Texas Intercollegiate Athletics Media Symposium. Uh, as you'll see on your program, uh, we were hoping to uh, have a hello from our dean, Dr. Jay Bernhardt. Unfortunately, as often happens in the world of deans, uh, he got pulled away to something else. And uh, he did uh, let me know that he wanted me to uh, communicate his welcome to everybody here, uh, especially to our, our panelists. Uh, we really appreciate uh, them making the effort to, uh, to be here. There are a lot of things. Uh, going on, as we know. Uh, so opening day in baseball, and we've got two Final Fours and all kinds of stuff to be excited about. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to get to that conversation really shortly. I want to just say a couple of words about uh, what our efforts are with the Center for Sports Communication and Media and just kind of give you an orientation to the program. Uh, and then I will uh, turn it over for some uh, further introductions of our first panel. Uh, so I should uh, point out, uh, let me just actually ask uh, the question for those of you in the room, uh, before this event anyway, had you heard of the Center for Sports Communication and Media? All right, so hey, that's a great number. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. We're new to the University of Texas, and uh, we're trying to, to do a number of things. Uh, one of those things is we're going to be looking at establishing some more opportunities for curriculum in sports communication and media, looking for more chances to get students connected to each other uh, in the classroom, also to faculty, and looking for more opportunities for students to connect uh, to professionals in the field. And, and we mean that across a range of possible uh, approaches to communication and media. So uh, yes, media studies and uh, production, uh, journalism and sports writing and uh, documentary filmmaking, uh, but we also are interested in uh, media relations and the advertising and public relations world, uh, and also in the world of communication studies. How, does, how do we think about sport as a way of, of communicating teamwork, uh, family relationships? Uh, what does sport mean to us as a public symbol? Uh, there are a lot of ways that we want to bring those interests together in the center. Uh, we're also looking at trying to, to develop the center as an opportunity for building research and uh, expertise in our fields. Uh, we're seeking partnerships with uh, sports organizations and, and media organizations here in Austin, in the state of Texas, and across the country. And in the long run, we anticipate that we're going to be a valuable resource for sports media uh, in a range of, of topics and, uh, and areas for discussion. And that leads us to programs uh, like this one, the opportunity to try to bring together some of the leading minds in the world of intercollegiate athletics, people who are making key decisions about uh, policy within athletics, but then also how we experience that through the media. And what better time to do that uh, when, uh, than when we're right before one of the signature events on the sports calendar. Uh, so it's our good fortune that the men's Final Four this year is located just down the road in San Antonio. And uh, one of our uh, colleagues and great supporters, Joe Lala, who's an instructor in the Stan Richards School of Advertising and Public Relations, uh, suggested to me several months ago, you know what, maybe, maybe this is an opportunity for us uh, to start a conversation with people who are going to be nearby and uh, let's bring them to Texas and see what we can do. And so I want to make sure I acknowledge uh, Joel because uh, not only did he have the idea in the first place, but he did an awful lot of, of the work in trying to bring people to, uh, to come to campus. So uh, Joel, I'm going to introduce you in just a second, but thank you very much for, for everything you've, you've done with getting this, uh, this event planned. Uh, I also need to acknowledge Christopher Hart. I don't think Chris is in the room right at the moment, but uh, especially for our guests today, Chris has been the person you've talked to the most, uh, and he is our program manager for the Center for Sports Communication and Media and has been instrumental in getting everything ready. Um, Sydney O'Connell, a student in uh, my class, uh, has also been helping us out today, uh, especially uh, greeting folks uh, on the way in, so thanks to Sydney too. So we've had a lot of support and opportunities to, to get excited about this event. Uh, but the event is what you are all here for, and so I will uh, use this moment to introduce Joe Lala, who, as I mentioned, is an instructor in the Stan Richards School of Advertising and Public Relations. Joe has a law degree from the University of North Carolina and uh, teaches a range of courses uh, in the advertising sequence. He also is an adjunct uh, uh, instructor in the UT School of Law. So he will set us up for our first panel. And with that, uh, let me once again say thank you and welcome and turn it over to Joel.
was for me and not for Michael. <laughs> thank you, Angie. It's very nice. Um, so again, I want to thank especially our panelists for coming here. I also want a special thanks for Dan Beebe for, put, for helping put this together um, with, uh, with me and, and with Mike and Chris, uh, helping to get people here, especially the, uh, the commissioner's panel. We've got a, a, just a, a terrific program for you. So I want to start it off with, um, with the uh, athletic director's panel. So our athletic directors can stop looking at their phones and come on up. <laughs> we'll, we'll introduce you like boxers. All right, so the first panelist is from the University of Alabama at six foot three, and I'm guessing. <laughs> six foot three. Four? Five? Six. Six? Yeah. Wow. You look more petite than that today. <laughs> is Greg Byrne from the University of Alabama. Uh, they were actually the runners-up this year in football to the University of Central Florida. That's right. <laughs> inside, inside there, not that inside, actually. Um, Greg, before he uh, got to, uh, to Alabama, was uh, for seven years, I think, the, the uh, vice president of athletics for, at the University of Arizona. Before that, he was at um, Mississippi State, where he was the youngest athletic director in Division I A. Um, so we're very, very fortunate to have, to have Greg here. Thank you for coming. To Greg's left is uh, most of you recognize Chris Del Conte, our new athletics director since uh, December. Um, Chris, prior to this, uh, came from um, TCU. <laughs> it's TCU, uh, where he was the AD since 2009. Um, won all kinds of, uh, won at least one NACTA award for athletic director of the year. Um, and, uh, and we're incredibly fortunate not only to have him here today, but to have him at the University of Texas. I think everyone's real excited about it. Uh, Chris was prior to uh, TCU. He was at Rice um, and was a, a track athlete actually at UC uh, Santa Barbara, and he still looks very quick to me. Um, the moderator of this panel, uh, coming down from New York, is uh, is, Dan, is uh, Matt Futterman, rather. Um, Matt is the deputy sports editor for New York Times, so we're really really fortunate to have him here. He's also a, an author of Players: How Sports Became a Business. So. If any of you are interested, it's a, it's a, it's a really fun read. Uh, it talks about the, the start of the agency business with IMG and television and how, essentially, as the title indicates, how sports became a business. It's a terrific read, and, uh, and hopefully uh, some of you will buy it. I think we'll be doing it in my world of sports business class. Uh, we'll be reading that uh, next, uh, next semester. Five, um, eight, hundred boy pen. <laughs> and also very quick. Um, and uh, prior to uh, the New York Times, um, uh, Matt was at the Wall Street Journal, and prior to that was part of a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning team at the Newark Star Ledger, which is in beautiful Newark, New Jersey. Um, so if, without any further ado, please uh, get started. Uh, well, thank you very much, Joel. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's always great to be on a college campus and speaking to the uh, smartest people of the next generation. I think uh, our generation has probably done a really good job of messing things up in this country, but so <laughs> we're leaving it to you guys to fix it up. Uh, I have full confidence in you. You're going to clean up all the, all the problems we've done. Um, sorry, I know it's a big job, but uh, I, think you got, I, I think you got this. Um, anyway, uh, so thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time, and uh, thank you guys for um, taking a few minutes to enlighten folks. So, um, we'll start off with Alabama. Uh, down a few touchdowns after the first half, and now your $7 million a year coach is bringing in a freshman who's throwing, what, four passes off season? Probably a few, probably a few more than that, but not, not a lot. Not many, yeah. not many. Not many of consequence more than that, right? Um, what's going through your mind? Well, excuse me, gentlemen. Turn your mics on. on. How's that? Is that good? There we go. All right. Um, well, obviously, uh, uh, Coach Saban has a pretty good uh, track record of making good decisions during football games. And so, uh, you know, I, I knew throughout the year that the coaches had a tremendous amount of uh, um, respect and belief in both our quarterbacks, both in Jalen and, and Tua. And so when when Tua came in, and if you if, if if you ever get to know Tua, he's you know he's from Hawaii. He's got a little bit of hang loose in him, and uh, pretty easygoing fella. And so I think he I think his uh, 
heartbeat didn't go up too much, and he came in and made some great plays, and we were fortunate to win a national championship. Th that's his heartbeat didn't go up. Your heartbeat? Oh, yeah, absolutely all? it did. <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, for all of us, it's part of what we love about sports is, the, is that competition, and you never know what's going to come uh, your way and, and what you're faced with. And so it really was a, it really was a special moment for, for our football program. Uh, for the team and for the fans, and and it, you know there was a lot of excitement for Georgia. They they were there for the first time in quite a while, and we were playing the game only probably about an hour and a half from their campus, and and so there was a there was a big uh, it, it was an incredible atmosphere at that game. It was really I, I've been around college sports my entire life, and it was really one of the best environments I've ever been around. Especially the way it turned out. It it <laughs> it made that environment even better. Right, right, and. Uh, you're watching a game like that. I imagine you were there, or were you? Or you're not there. Okay, and watching on television, and you've taken over this great university's athletic department. Uh, incredible history with its football team. Are you watching and thinking, "I got to get my team back there. I got. I got to get my school. I got to do what I got to do in order to get my team so they're in a position to play in this game at some point." Not really. I was thinking, "What is that coach doing?" <laughs> Who, I think he's the only guy in America that could really put in a freshman. I mean, there's a saying here, Dale Royal, dance with the one that brung you. The guy that was 25-2 and two starter, to take him out at half and put in a freshman that was not tested, he might be the only coach in the country that can pull that off. And that just tells you how much confidence Nick had in that, not only Coach Saban had in that kid, but his gravitas as a head coach. I mean, I was more amazed by that moment than anything else. Uh, and how I wouldn't have done that. I'm, I'm sure our, I've asked every one of our coaches, no way, you're 25 and two, you know, and to make that move was awesome. Man, I think for the University of Texas, that's the level that, uh, that we're accustomed to in our history, and uh, we know we got to get back to that point. But uh, at that time when someone else, and then you're watching what they're doing, and, and Greg's a dear friend of mine, and for him to be there and win that championship in his first time at Alabama, um, it was awesome. I was just sharing the moment with him, texting him back and forth, saying, are you kidding me? You're going to win this thing? And don't get a ring that's like a brass knuckle. You know what I mean? Get one that's a little bit, you know. They're, it, they're, it's coming. They're so big, they're like brass knuckles. You can't even wear them. It's ridiculous, you know. It's awesome. It's amazing how many folks said, hey, congratulations, great job. And I'd say, you know, that bottle of water had about as much to do with winning the national championship as I did. But uh, it was it really fun to be along for the ride and watch, you know, Coach Saban talks about the process and watching that process throughout the year. Yeah, that process. Yeah, bench, your, bench your veteran quarterback in the, in the, at halftime and put in the freshman. <laughs> I imagine that's not written in the playbook. But, uh, yeah, but I guess as you try and get Texas, I mean, you've come here. What do you see as your mission statement? To win. I think we participate in intercollegiate, intercollegiate athletics to win championships, to graduate to do it the right way. I think the one first thing that we have at the University of Texas on our mission statement is integrity. And you had uh, uh, every program has gone through ebb and flows. You could look uh, before Nick Saban was there, they had a huge downward uh, turn. He comes back. Uh, you look at LSU. I think LSU won the first their championship in 58. He comes back, and they win one there. So everyone's had their time in the gauntlet. And uh, for us, we knew with the Mac Brown was here 16 years and was unbelievable. Won a championship and played for a couple more. So when you start to look at, uh, it's hard to win a national championship. And uh, uh, we know that's our charge in every one of our sports is to, is to compete for championships. That's why you compete in intercollegiate athletics. And we're recruiting the student athletes that uh, dare to dream that dream. So is it as simple and also as complicated as finding that magic coach? That person that, I mean, because they don't make a lot of them, you know, these days. Uh, they don't, there's not a lot of Belichicks, not a lot of Sabins. Is, is, uh, that, is I, that really I, a, a number, the, your 1A priority? I think I, I have a theory, which, I mean, you have uh, administrators here that are a lot smarter than me and they've been around a long time, but I do believe that college is a coach's game. Pros is a player's game. I firmly believe that you get great coaches in college that are going to shape young minds, 18 and 22-year-old kids that are still developing and get the very best out of them. And it's uh, when the pros, the pros is a player's game. And, and, and players dominate pros, but in college, it's about the, the right coach, the right fit to go recruit the right student athletes to come and play for you. And um, this is why you see a lot of change. You see a lot of trying to fit, find the right fit and work. And, and I, I believe that when you get a guy like a Nick, or you can look at a guy uh, across the board, Pete Carroll at USC. USC went through tons and tons of coaches. 
since John McKay. And he was able to put the genie back in the bottle and was a great coach, great motivator, great recruiter. But those are, are, are hard to come by. So I do believe that college athletics is a coach's game and the pros are a player's game. So Greg, can you explain this job, the athletic director's job, which uh, I'm going to make myself sound like something of an old guy here, but when I was going to college, the athletic director, maybe he'd been a coach, maybe he'd been a physical education teacher, he sort of organized the buses and made sure the meal money got to, uh, you know, for us it was five bucks, a di you know, five bucks for the trip, you know, from Union College to Hamilton or wherever we were playing that day, and, you know, we all got a little bit of meal money. And that was basically the, the athletic director and his assistant who were handling all those things. And I don't know that it was that different. Obviously, the scale is different. But at a big university, it was still very much sort of administrative. What happened? When did this job become essentially the president and CEO of a multi-million dollar business? Well, I think it evolved over the last dramatically over the last 25, 30 years. I, my dad was the athletic director at Oregon from 1984 to 1992, and I, I, he had the article when he got named AD. He was 38 years old. The finalists were him, the owner of a local sporting goods store in town, and uh, the AD at Los Angeles College. And, he, and what was his background? He was the fundraiser at Oregon. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so he became the AD at a young age, and that was back when Phil Knight hadn't built his little sneaker company yet. And so to the level that it is today, so Phil wasn't involved in the manner that he is at Oregon. And they literally had no resources. Oh, quick side story, uh, he woke me up one morning and he'd say, you know, he, often he'd wake me up and say, go put on your work clothes, we're going down to campus to work on something, to do something. And their, their, football, their football offices were inside the basketball arena. They'd have three or four coaches to an office and back then, you'd have the you know the eight millimeter film up on the wall, and and uh, they'd be on recruiting calls underneath their desk because you didn't have cell phones, and the carpet was so bad it had holes throughout it, and it was dirty, it was ratty, and uh, we installed the local carpet guy in town had donated some carpet. It was orange shag carpet, in Oregon State's colors were orange and black, Oregon's were green and yellow, but I had never installed carpet before that day, but we installed orange shag carpet because it, it was it, that's all we had to work with. Um, to where it is today, to where obviously your fundraising is very sophisticated. Every part of your uh, enterprise of college athletics is very sophisticated. And uh, I think as television continued to have more of an impact, resources continued to increase. Uh, and so now a lot of us are, are managing 100 plus million dollar budgets, closer, some closer to 200 million. And uh, looking at Texas there. And, uh, and so anyways, as that continued to change and the, and the opportunities from a Title IX standpoint, which was incredible, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of young women who have had opportunities that weren't there before to be involved in college athletics. And so then on a daily basis, what Chris and I can deal with, we obviously have 500 to 700 student athletes in most of our universities. We have about 350 employees at Alabama for our 21 sports. Uh, we're part of our campus and I sit on our president's cabinet uh, to uh, dealing with faculty. Uh, you're also going to be involved with compliance and operations and, and obviously the academic side of your department, fundraising, marketing. Uh, and so there's a lot that t takes place just within the walls of your department. But then on top of that, you're going to be dealing from an external standpoint with the media, uh, with, with, with the shoe companies, with the NCAA, with your conference offices. Uh, and so there are a lot of things that happen on a daily basis where you're getting pulled in a hundred different directions and part of our, you know, part of what I really enjoy about what I get to do, I love being around the, the kids, I love being around the student athletes and watching 18 to 22 year olds continue to grow and mature and the experiences they have. But I also absolutely really love the, just the diversity of what takes place on a daily basis in a college athletic environment. And the last thing is, you know, I don't think it gets enough tension. Within the walls of our department, we have young men and young women show up that show up maybe with the latest technology, fancy car, a closet full of the latest clothes, and we have other young men and young women that show up maybe with a t-shirt on their back and just a few other things, and we all come together and we check our differences at the door, and we all work together academically and athletically for our universities. And that's really a special environment that I don't think gets quite enough credit uh, on a daily basis. 
Now, with that, two hundred million dollar budgets and is a, is and scrutiny, increased scrutiny, and a lot of different responsibilities, is what has become a pretty intense pressure to perform. Uh, th this job is different in that sense as well. You used to uh, used to not know who the athletic director were was, and if the football team didn't do so well, that was usually the football coach's fault, and it didn't fall to the athletic director. How much pressure are you under to here at Texas to get the you know get your big teams doing very well? Well, I think I'm, I'm managing uh, an enterprise based on people's passion. And most rational people become irrational when it comes to their passion. So also I have to offer a little bit of sanity to that. I, and, 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 I, and I use humor a lot and, and, and to, to bring a tense situation to a little levity to it because we're still educating young people. Commissioner Bowlesby uh, uh, tells me all the time that outside of the GI Bill, college athletics provides more opportunity for young people to get an education in this country, free education. But we have this appetite of, of winning. We want to win championship. It, 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 that, uh, coming from TCU, we had 5,000 applicants for admission. We go the Rose Bowl and it's up to 22,000. The Flutie effect. The, in, the institution went from allowing 1,600 kids into school, the same 1,600 at 4,000, basically you're paying to play, to now all of a sudden 20, 22,000 people for the same 1,600 spots. Same faculty, nothing's changed. All of a sudden now, a child that's coming here, SAT goes from one level to another. And that's the same thing that happened at Boston College with uh, when Flutie was there, when Duke basketball was a great regional school in the 80s. I grew up in Taos, New Mexico, I never heard of Duke. Them jokers go to the final four. I'm like, yeah, baby, that's Duke. Now I get it. Sports, the front porch. It's the window into your institution. So is there pressure? Dang right there's pressure. At this place, you come to the University of Texas because they demand the best. They want to be the best. They want to support the best. And your job is to make sure that you give our coaches and our student athletes all the tools necessary to compete. No different than our students. You look around this room. If you're using 1950 Bunsen burners, are you going to go to that school to learn chemistry? Or are you going to come down here where they have the finest equipment ever to give you the very best chance to do what you need to do for the rest of the, your life? So this, there's a big parallel between academic success for young people and athletic success providing them the same. Great. A applications up at the University of Alabama? Yeah. <coughs> They're all from Texas, by the way. <laughs> there's a few of them from Texas, absolutely. Uh, especially some linemen. When, uh, Easy, wheezy. <laughs> when... Uh, 2007, when Coach Saban came to town, and there was a president named Dr. Witt, um, who had a great vision for the university, and there's obviously incredible history at the University of Alabama as well. Uh, enrollment was about 18,000. Uh, now we are, this year, uh, about uh, 38, 39,000. And the, the campus has got cranes up in a lot of places, and it, there's been incredible growth. And, and obviously, with the, the success of the football program, really in a historical manner, um, that's led to a lot of interest. I, I, the, the, the Sunday night it came out that I was uh, uh, going to come to Alabama. Uh, by 6 p.m. the next day, I, I had 1,272 text messages, and I probably had a couple hundred emails and you know probably 30, 40 phone calls and and even some old-fashioned letters too. Um, it took me a month and a half, but I got back to every single one of them. I was om almost to the end. I still had some phone calls left, and I'm, I'm, at our base I'm now at Alabama, and I'm at our baseball game on a Sunday afternoon. I go back to my office to knock out the rest of the phone calls. I look at these messages like, Dwayne Richardson. The only Dwayne Richardson I know is the managing partner of Price Waterhouse Coopers out in Portland, Oregon. He, when I, early in my career when I worked for the Ducks, he was, he was very active with the Ducks. So I look at the numbers 503 which is downtown Portland I call the number every time I used to talk to Dwayne I'd say Dwayne how you doing and he always say never been better which is a great way to give a positive response so I said hey Dwayne Greg Byrne I said how are you doing I call him and he picks up the phone I said Dwayne Greg Byrne how you doing he said never been better I said I haven't talked to you for 20 years and he said I know he said I want to call and congratulate you uh on becoming the AD at Alabama I said well thanks and really an honor and and then he said, and also my son's a freshman there and he needs a job. I'm like, okay, well, the truth of the call comes out. And I said, Portland, Oregon, you're the biggest, one of the biggest Duck fans I know and you come all the way, your son comes all the way to Alabama. And he said, yeah, he and a couple classmates 
right up with what has happened to Alabama. They want to come and be a part of it. And, uh, and so literally from the northwest tip of our country almost all the way to the southeastern part of our country, and we have, we have kids from all over the United States. You go out to our student section, ton of kids from the northeast, ton of kids from Texas. And, uh, and obviously, just like what Chris said, and he's 100% right, that's been a, the, the impact that athletics has had. Certainly, it, it, you can't discount that for the, the growth of the university. Now, you mentioned before, obviously, these big budgets that you have. Whenever I give a talk, especially in front of uh, a group of college students, the first question they always ask is, uh, should the students get paid, especially in the revenue sports? Um, where are you on this right now, uh, given, <coughs> given how rich this business has become? Did you notice you send softball questions to Greg and just <laughs> throw me under the bus out of the get-go? I really appreciate I'm gonna that. I'm going to make him answer uh, it as well. Real nice. I get that. Well, uh, I'm a, for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm against all of it. Only 1% or 2% of our student athletes go pro. So I'm going to go back from the beginning for a moment. I think the greatest thing that's ever happened in college athletics is Title IX opportunity for young people to get an unbelievable education. But it was a federally mandated law that was not funded. Think through that. A federally mandated law that says you will do this, but we're not going to help you fund it. So what happens is if you look at my economics, I have two, and I'm going to just use this, I'm not comparing with shampoo, but I have two products, two sports that make money, both uh, football and men's basketball. I have 19 other products that do not, yet we fund them equally. We give them the same opportunities based on the law. But if you were in business, would you fund them that way? You'd have two sports. If you read Jack Walsh's book, Winning, what did he do? Kept the two, there were one or two, and everyone else that was not spun him off, his stock went through the roof, and he retires a billionaire. That's not what happens in collegiate athletics. So we have two sports that generate all the revenue for us to participate in. So with only one or two percent that have a chance to go pro, the rest of them have a chance to get a change of their life through education. And if a student gets a degree from the University of Texas, over his lifetime he'll make a million more dollars than if he did not have a degree. There lies the value, right? There lies the value. So to me, we forget that uh, uh, we could say, okay, you're going to go, we're going to pay you. Who, how, about your, how, how much food we spend, your travel, your trainers, your academic tutors, your advisors, everything that we provide for young people across all of our sports, the revenue is coming from two sources. But the academic departments aren't encumbered by the same laws that I am. The academic departments on universities are not encumbered by the same laws. So we are encumbered by different laws and different ways of us having to fund it. So I don't, I look at it and never thought I firmly believe in the amateur model. Because the reality of it is we are the pros, you can go now they have one and done. Hopefully the NBA will figure out. I love what uh, Commissioner Ackerman has in the, with, with the Big East. If you want to go to college, stay two years, then go pro. If you're in the baseball, you want to go to college, stay three years. But if you want to go pro, go pro. Those have not been afforded to us. Mo Bamba, we have a player here that uh, is going to go pro. That, that his temple is worth $50 million. That's life-changing money for he and his family. Go do that. I love that. But, it doesn't, it, but the rest of those kids aren't going to have that opportunity. But they can become a doctor, a lawyer, a productive citizen. Through sport, they're given that opportunity. So I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a hardened supporter of the, the amateur model. And I think that uh, if they want a professional model, there's those opportunities for them to go do that. Now, just to follow up with you before I turn to Greg, you <coughs> mentioned how much opportunity can come if they get that degree. Given the demands that have been put on, especially Division I athletes, but also in, divi in divisions two and three, um, you know, I know I, I have friends whose ki kids are going playing, you know, division three soccer. They're at campus in July, uh, playing in captain's practices. They're in the weight room all off season, and if they're not, they're not involved. With, you know, they're not involved with the team. It's a huge commitment. You know, you move into something like football. It's I don't know, forty hours a week, fifty hours a week. Are these kids getting the time? and the resources in order to get their degree in five years? Is, it, it, we, is, that, is the deal still there? You come here, we'll give you the opportunity. You can play, we're not gonna pay you, but we're gonna give you the opportunity of this education. Are the universities holding up to their end of the bargain? University of Texas, we have a 90% graduation rate. What does that tell you? 
no doubt about it. Young people want it. Young people, when I was a student athlete, I, didn't, I, I wanted to spend all my time in my craft. I don't have the video games and the net, whatever, the, you know, the, all that other junk. It was about wanting to be the very best. I, my waking moments was at the gym. My waking moments were trying to be the very best I could possibly be. And these young people have dreams of playing the NFL, have dreams of, of representing our country. 80, you know, the Olympic Games, if you look every four years, college athletics provides 80% of the Olympic student athletes are, come from colleges. 80%. You know, think about that. From other countries as well. Uh, correct. From the universities. So these young, these are highly, highly selective student athletes, especially at our levels here, that have dreams of something greater than they ever thought possible. And that's the coach. A coach, to me, my coaches are the greatest assets I've ever had because they believed in me when I never believed in myself. So what does a coach do? These kids want all that. Plus, there's a lot of shenanigans here in Austin they can go do. <laughs> Get in trouble over there. Right? Go no trouble over here. And they want that. But when you have a 90% graduation rate, I think proof's in the pudding. Uh, Greg, a little twist on the question to you. I imagine, I, I, do you, you share his view that the student athletes shouldn't I, be paid? I believe, in, I believe in amateurism, absolutely. Okay, but now let's do, make a little well, twist a on softball. it. That's a softball. Right. <laughs> little, <laughs> little twist on it, though. Who gets, a, 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 what I think is a terrible thing happened in college sports this week, which is that Katie Ledecky, the best swimmer in the world, announced that she was going professional, which means she will no longer swim for Stanford University, uh, where she's been there for two years, 4.0 average. She is everything that you would want on your sports team at your university. At your, is she, you would want her front and center. Not only would you want her front and center, you'd probably want a visa or any other big company putting her on commercials and advertising that this girl has, excuse me, woman, has a 4.0 average, she's the best swimmer in the world, and you can go see her swim uh, for $8 or whatever it costs to go into a swim meet, probably not even $8, probably free, uh, next weekend against UCLA or Cal or wherever. Who gets harmed if Katie Ledecky get some money from Visa or Kellogg's or whatever other country, uh, excuse me, whatever other company wants to pay her and still swims for Stanford while she trains for another 50 Olympic medals. I, I, read, the, I read Wetzel's article the other day. Dan's one of the best writers out there, always very creative where he comes from with, with a lot of thought into it. Obviously, when you're dealing with an enterprise with thousands upon thousands of, of student athletes at, at all the various levels that you talked about, it's not one size fits every single situation perfectly, but we do have a model that is trying to uh, be manageable for the thousands upon thousands of student athletes and the universities, which is the, the NCAA are, are the schools. Um, and so we decided to create this model and understanding that from a uh, name image and likeness standpoint during that time, they weren't gonna go out and market uh, and, and use that to sign of deal with Visa. The reality is 99.9% .9 of all student athletes probably don't have that value uh, when they come in at 18 uh, to 22 years old. Uh, the universities, in Katie's case, it was the Olympics that helped raise her, her uh, profile, and she did a great job, did a wonderful job representing our country. Um, and so I know that's the, the debate, and you say, well, just let her those opportunities. At the same time, too, I can also tell you in the competitive world of recruiting, and Texas and Alabama are gonna go head to head on kids regularly. Are you gonna create a market where all of a sudden, you're instead of trying to say, let's go fund our scholarships, let's go support our, our facilities, the infrastructure that we have to keep up now and with the new tax plan is gonna make it a little more challenging. Um, say, okay, well, let's refocus that and say, we need to go cut marketing deals for student athletes to potentially to get them to come to the school. I'm not sure if that is where we should be spending our time and resources and energies as, as, as universities. On top of that, the other thing I struggle with, back to what your original question was, Sunday night I was driving to Birmingham with, with two people in my car. One of them coaches eight-year-old baseball. And, then, uh, and he was telling me about all the parents' stories. That every, about every dang parent on that team thinks their son is gonna get a college scholarship and they're gonna play for the Yankees, okay? The reality is most likely none of them are. 
but you see the, the time and energy and resources that families put into youth sports from grade school all the way through high school. And the, the pursuit of it for many of them is to try to get that college scholarship. And they, they perceive that as a value, that that's something that they can uh, obtain by having athletic success. And there's a lot of other ways to get a college scholarship as well. And then we sometimes somehow have a disconnect when we get to the universities and I see the media out there and they write, boy, they're not getting anything for their athletic, what they do athletically. And then I go look at our, you know, I go to our, uh, sit in a budget meeting and I look at all the line items on our budget and I say, for well, for them not getting anything, we're sure spending a lot of money on their experience. And I don't, and I, I don't think we do a very good job of having that be a balanced discussion that's out there on what those real dollars are that we are spending on their experience that Chris talked about. There's a value at the University of Texas or the University of Alabama for your men's or women's basketball program that when they get done with the game that they go get on a chartered flight and they come back to campus and they're in class the very next morning. There's a value on that compared to jumping on a bus and going on a 12-hour bus ride. There's a value in the way we feed them on the level of coaching that they have, the, the mental health support that we have for our student athletes, the, the, the uh, life skills that we teach them from managing money to writing resumes to doing all these different things and being exposed to some incredible experiences along the way. Those are all part of that experience that they're having that, that really is an incredible experience that I think we need to do a better job of it within our own walls of our departments of talking to the young people in our department about, about what they are receiving when they are here because I th don't think a lot of them even know that. Now you mentioned, I just want to ask that. Joel, how are, are we on time? Just Absolutely. Anyone have any questions? Uh, come up to the mic. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just out of curiosity, you guys said you uh, were at the University of Arizona before and you were at TCU before. I'm curious as to how quick you either get rid of the other schools' uniforms and like apparel you have or <laughs> keep it throughout. <laughs> Well, my my, uh, my sons both go to the University of Arizona. Uh, my youngest one doesn't it doesn't wear my size, but my oldest one does. So he's got some pretty good swag. Um, and then, uh, but you're always going to be a fan uh, of, especially when the student athletes are still there, because you know I know Chris does this too. You get, in, I mean, you, you can't get to know all of them very well, but you sure try to. And and. It, it is, it's such a special environment to be in, and if you don't still feel that connection, even after you're gone, I, I, I don't think your heart's in the right place with that. So uh, you may not, you know, I'm not, I didn't, I'm not wearing any Arizona stuff around Tuscaloosa, Alabama, but at the same time, too, uh, as long as we're not playing each other head to head, I always want them to do well. Uh, nah. oh, sorry about that. Same. No, no, I, no, I, no. I gave away 302 ties one day. So pretty much, I can promise you, I had a 10-year extensive purple wardrobe, as Commissioner Bozeman will tell you. So yes, but I'll never, I mean, I have boots that are beautiful to have TCU on them. I love them. But if I wear a TCU boot around the state, someone sees that, what's going to happen? What the hell are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, even better, they'll take a, so, pic they'll take a picture. I can, I, can wear them in, I can wear them in Rome, but nowhere else. You know what I mean? It's the way it works. Go ahead. How much does the new tax plan affect what the two of you do in terms of fundraising? Uh, you know, I, I, I flip flop on this because the reality the deduction went from, from 12, 12 to 24,000. So when you think about priority seating for a moment, I'm not too sure how it's going to affect someone because even if you have a double the deduction at 24,000, the way the interest, the interest rates dropped on, on, on real estate, I'm not too sure you can even get to 24,000 in a deduction anyway. So I think we're going to be okay on that part because if you had if you had two thousand, three thousand, four thousand for a seat, I, I, the, the, to me you're still you, you, the write-off was never going to go from twelve to twenty-four anyway. You weren't going to be able to you would never maximize the twenty-four thousand. Does that make sense? So I think we'll be okay on that. I do believe that on stadium funding and how you do uh, 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 new new facility projects that could that could pose some challenges. But we've been working with attorneys for the last couple of weeks and. There's creative ways that, that are within the law that will be okay, but a lot of it's just gonna be educating our donors because it, it, it got scary there for a while because people are thinking, 
uh, oh my gosh, this is my ride house going to go? But they didn't count. They, a lot of people didn't take into account that that you, you could do, your deduction doubled from 12 to 24. They were still thinking, wait a minute, I can't write that off. But when you start to think about it and you start doing your taxes, you realize to get to $24,000 is pretty difficult in, in the way that the new the way the new structure works. So I'm not as worried as I once was. I'm, I'm I, on the annual side. I'm, I agree. I, I think on the capital side, depending on how your uh, university takes a stance on it, I think it could have a, a significant impact. And that's that's how um, you know the, as we're what Chris said earlier about Title IX being a federally unfunded mandate. Um, we're really glad about that, but but the deduction from the donations has been one way we've been able to keep our facilities up. And and when you have a our football, both our football stadiums are over 100,000 people. That takes a lot to keep those things up on an annual basis and, and a good experience for your fans. And so uh, uh, I don't know if when, when the reform, tax reform was done, if the intention was to not allow those to be deductible. Uh, I've heard mixed stories on that. Uh, I'm hoping that we can get some clarity on some rulings here in the future. Uh, next. Well, I got one more question for you. Um, you mentioned before you were talking about the mental health of your students. Probably one of the more tragic stories of the last few years uh, was uh, the um, Washington State quarterback killed himself. Uh, I think it was in December. Um, and it sort of brought into light the pressure that uh, a lot of these young people are under. I mean, we're just talking about kids who are 18 to 22. Um, I know you want to win. First thing you said, my job here is to win, win with integrity. Uh, is the pressure too much to put on these kids? I think that uh, society puts so much pressure on everybody. It's not a student athlete, it's everybody. I, I, uh, if you ever worked in a, any time a young person takes their life for whatever reason, whether it be a student athlete or a student, that's a horrific occasion. You know, the young people are not ready to deal with mortality. This is a vibrant time in their life when they're coming to college to really discover who they are. In the next 50 years, they hope to change the world. And you start out with this group is going to change the world. And when someone does that, you st when I I've, I've been in I've worked at departments where we've lost two or three student athletes over a period of time, and it's absolutely devastating. So I, I, my heart went out to them because I just couldn't figure such a sad occasion. I don't know if it's pressure internally. You don't know what if it's pressure from wherever it may come from, but I don't think it's sports specific. I think there was social issues. That child was feeling something difficult and he was helpless and decided um, that he would take his own life and that is tragedy. Dep depression doesn't discriminate. And uh, and I think uh, it's, it's critical for your departments to have uh, talk to your student athletes about depression, about if, if, if there are issues you're going through in your life that we have resources here to help you with, either within your department or within your campus. And, uh, and that you also talk about bystander intervention, if there's things that you see or hear uh, uh, from one of your teammates, one of your, one of your workers, that you report it. And that, uh, that there'll be no retaliation or anything for those things. Um, you know, unfortunately, that that was that's that's tragic. What happened there, um, and and your heart goes out to everybody up there at Washington State, that on the team and the student body and and everybody. Um, and at the same time, too, when you have the number of people that you have in your departments, there will be there are going to be life issues that will happen, and and sometimes. Um, uh, you know, they're going to get a lot more attention when they happen within the walls of the athletics department because of the media that's there covering it on, an, on a regular basis already. But what you want to do is you do the best job you can to, to offer those, uh, you know, all the, all the support mechanisms that we do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it was just such a sad deal to, to have that happen. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. I think we're just about out of time. A couple of days ago, that there was going to be a home and home Alabama Texas football series. Really, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> is that is that confirmed? What'd you say? <laughs> We're working on some home and homes. All right. That's about as deep as I'll go right now. Okay, we've got some time here together, so hopefully we can make some news here. <laughs>
<laughs> Del Conte's got two phones now, so he's even, he's even busier than he used to be. Okay. I'm eliminating one. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Thanks, Thanks very much.